So let's go ahead and dive in. Appreciate you guys being here for week six of the discipleship program that we're doing online. For those of you who have missed a week or two, we have an online mechanism to catch up. That happens in one of two places. You can either be a part of our Facebook group, which anybody can join. You just have to be approved, but we approve everybody. So go on to Facebook and search for Scott Ross Online Discipleship, and you'll find our group. And there we've posted the first four weeks. Week five has not been posted because I haven't had the chance to edit it, but it will be posted either today or tomorrow. And that would catch you up to the week that we're doing right now, which is week six. The other place to find them is on my YouTube channel. And you can go look for Scott Ross Online Discipleship on YouTube. And you will find the first four weeks there. And again, the fifth one will be posted either today or tomorrow so that you can get caught up. For those of you who are new or um, have been here maybe another week, but you haven't been engaged fully in the program, there's two books that you're going to want to get. And in the comments section below this video uh, on YouTube, I have the links for those books. We also have the links for the books in the Facebook group. But the two books are How to Study Your Bible by Kay Arthur and The God Who Knows and Cares for You. And that's also by Kay Arthur. It's a study of the book of John. Again, the link to get to both of those on Amazon to make sure that you have the correct book is in the comment section below or in the in the uh, information section below this video on YouTube. It's also on the Facebook page. So I encourage you guys to get those books. They'll be very edifying for you. With that said, let's open with a word of prayer and we'll dive into this week's study. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everybody who is within the sound of my voice right now. I pray that this study would be edifying. I pray that it would cause them to grow into the full measure of the maturity of Christ. I pray that through this study, we become equipped to do your will, to take the gospel to the lost, and to not just make believers, but to make disciples out of all nations. And I pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. Okay. So let's dive in real quickly to um, some scripture memorization that we're supposed to be doing as a group. And if you haven't been memorizing the scripture as we go, don't worry. You can absolutely catch up. We're doing it very easily. When I went through my discipleship program, I had to do two scriptures a week. We're doing one a week. So we've only got a few here. and We actually skipped a week. So we've only got uh, four scriptures at this point that you're going to have to have memorized. And uh, the first one we learned was 2 Corinthians 5.17. Now, just to recap, the system that we're using is we have a tagline that we use. Then we say the scripture reference, then the scripture itself, then the reference again. So, for instance, the tagline here is new life in Christ. And so we would say new life in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5. 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'll say it again. New life in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5.17. The second one we learned with the same tagline is Galatians 2.20. So we would say, new life in Christ, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. So those are the two new life in Christ scriptures. The second tagline that we tackled was the word. And the first scripture we learned from the word was Joshua 1.8. And it says, the word, Joshua 1.8. The book of the law, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Joshua 1 8. The new scripture we're going to memorize for the word is this one. Second Timothy 3 16 and 17. And so we'll go through this one twice. We would say the word second Timothy 3 16 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Say it again. The word, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. 
So I would encourage you guys to memorize those, and I'll just show them to you one more time. We've got 2 Corinthians 5.17. We've got Galatians 2.20. Both of those are new life in Christ. Then we've got the Word, which is Joshua 1.8, and 2 Timothy 3.16.17. Hold yourself accountable to someone. Uh, make yourself say the scripture to them at the end of every day, the little bit you've gotten. And I just say this, it's like the whole, um, the old analogy of eating an elephant. We do it one bite at a time. So for instance, you might just recite to yourself the tagline and the scripture reference six or seven times in a row as your first step. It would sound like this, the word, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, the word, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. The word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. Just like that. Just say that over and over again. And then you might add on all scripture is breathed. So you would say the word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed. The word, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture is breathed. And you just slowly add one word or one phrase at a time. And by the end of the seventh day, it's no big deal. You can do this sitting in traffic. You can do this while you're waiting in the line at Chipotle to order your lunch. You can do this all kinds of places. It really doesn't matter. Um, and it only takes a few seconds every day for you to start to bury the word of God in your heart. And that becomes a very, very powerful tool in your arsenal. With that said, I want to quickly give you guys this summation that is a famous thing. We're studying the book of John and there are seven what are known as I am phrases in the book of John, and they're just well, well known. In fact, many, many pastors have done sermon series called the seven I am's where they review these seven I am's. And we have covered so far the first two. The first one says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world, John 6, 35 and 51. We covered that last week. And then we've also, are this week going to cover, I am the light of the world. It shows up in John 8, 12, and we're in John 7 and 8 this week. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So with that said, let's dive into our two books, and we're going to start with our How to Study Your Bible by K. Arthur. And we're on chapter six, Let Scripture Interpret Scripture. So this is something known as hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is essentially the science of how to accurately interpret a document. Um, it's not just used for the Bible, although hermeneutics is most often used in reference to Bible study. But there are hermeneutics. Uh, hermeneutics is applied to ancient writings of all kinds. You know, um, the ancient Greek philosophers, um, you know, the, the history of Ro the Roman Empire, other ancient doc documents use hermeneutics. And in fact, hermeneutics can even be applied to modern documents. But it's it's rules on how do you make sure that your interpretations are accurate. And so one of the things that we've talked about up to this point is the power and the importance of context. Context is absolutely essential when it comes to interpreting scripture accurately. We've got to know what happened before, what happened after, what is being said, who's saying it, why are they saying it, who are they talking to, uh, what is the big picture point that they're trying to make here? So we want to make sure that we get context right. But then there's an even bigger context, which is what do we see from all of Scripture about what we're studying? Because we want Scripture to interpret Scripture. So if we're learning about grace, what does all of Scripture say about grace? If we're learning about the Messiah, what does all of Scripture say? about the Messiah. And so what this chapter, chapter six is about is the techniques that we can use to make sure that we're accurately interpreting the scriptures. So what I want to talk about and what this chapter talks about is the process of cross-referencing, cross-referencing. Now, last week, we introduced you to a tool called blueletterbible.org, which is an online accumulation of tools that allow you to do word study 
and in-depth scripture study. And we talked about the need for what's called a concordance. And we said in the old days, before the internet, you had to buy this giant book that was like a giant encyclopedia or a dictionary that had every word from the Bible listed and it and the concordance listed every place in scripture that that word shows up. So if you look up the word grace in con- in the concordance you would see every single scripture reference that has the word grace in it. Well, we don't need to buy those concordances anymore because we now have them on our phone. We have them on the internet. And Blue Letter Bible is a perfect example of a tool where you can put in a word and it'll show you everywhere that word shows up in scripture in any given translation. So you might say, show me everywhere that grace shows up in the ESV. Show me everywhere that grace shows up in the in ET, the net. Show me everywhere grace shows up in the HCSB or the NASB. And you can cross reference. And so that's the first thing we want to do is when we're studying a word, we want to cross reference it by using the concordance feature of these websites and see everywhere else that we see that word used. And we want to go look those scriptures up and read them also in context to see what illumination do they give us to the word we're studying in the book we're in. So we're in the book of John. You know, we we come to the book of John and we might say, um, be in, I don't know, let me go to uh, my book of John. We might be in John chapter 7, uh, verse 1, and, oops, sorry. And it says, after this, Jesus went about in Galilee. Well, where is Galilee? What do we learn about Galilee? So we could actually look up the word Galilee and find everywhere else that Galilee appears in scripture. And we could see that it's listed in um, First Chronicles 6, 7, 6 as an example. Joshua 19, 27. 1 Kings 9, 11 through 13. Judges 1, 30 through 33. So we can start to go research Galilee and everything we want to learn about that if we were interested in that. Um, it says in verse 2, now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. What's the feast of booths? Well, we could look that up as well. What do we learn about the Feast of Booths? And where is it referenced? Well, we see it's referenced in Leviticus 23, 39 through 43. And it was one of three great festivals in Jewish culture celebrating the completion of the agricultural year. And um, it commemorated their deliverance from Egypt. So they would build tents and sleep in the tents just like they did when they left Egypt. So we can cross-reference anything in scripture by taking that word or phrase, putting it into our uh, concordance or our online Bible study tool, and we'll be able to find out everything there is to know about that word or about that topic. The other thing is, is that a lot of the tools today, and even many of your Bibles will have cross-references already in them. So for instance, if you've ever opened your physical Bible and you see little letters like A, B, C that are, they're, they're very small, but they're normally in a dark, bold print. Well, in the middle column of your Bible or down at the bottom, there will be that same letter and you'll see other scriptures listed by that letter. Those are cross references that the publisher or the editor of that translation or that particular publication of that translation believes could be helpful to you, the reader. And so that's another way that you can cross reference. So when we're studying the Bible, we want to cross reference a lot because we don't want to just learn about it within, you know, we don't want to be myopic and only see it through tunnel vision of what we see in this one book because scripture always interprets scripture and scripture always edifies scripture so we want to learn as much as we can and get as many reference points as we can and that's the point of chapter six so with that said are there any questions before we dump, uh, jump into our actual study of the book of john for this week going once going twice okay it looks like we don't have any questions on that so let's dive in to John 7 and 8. 
So I'm going to pull up my study here. Give me one moment. I'm pulling up my notes. Okay. So in John chapter 7, what we see here is something very, very interesting. It starts in verse 1. It says, After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Let me ask you this. What do we learn right here that's a very significant fact about Jesus? Well, Richard says not even his family believed, and that is true. Todd says his brothers did not believe. But you're saying something in both of your answers that is something we didn't know. What is that? If it was a snake, it would bite you. Aha! He has brothers. Jesus had brothers. Now, the interesting part about that is that Catholicism teaches us that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was eternally a virgin, that she is still a virgin, and that she is to be revered as holier than any other woman who's ever lived. Well, how is this possible? Jesus had brothers. He had physical, um, you know, genetic brothers. So what that tells us is Mary was not a virgin eternally. Mary had a relationship with her husband like any other wife would have a relationship with her husband. And it's just another example of kind of some of the nonsense that happens when we get into the traditions of certain faith systems and how they're not biblical at all. And in fact, one of Jesus's brothers is going to play a very, very significant role in church history because his name is James. And we have a book in the Bible that is named after him. And the fact that James became a believer is one of the apologetics for the resurrection of Christ. Because when James, so James is one of the brothers, his own brothers didn't believe him. In fact, it, you can hear it's kind of a mocking tone here. I mean, he knows the Jews want to kill him, so he's not going to go. And his brothers are like, hey. Just why don't you go to why don't you go to Judea, huh? Why don't you go up there? And then then your disciples, your little believers, all your little crazy followers, they can see everything you're doing. Hey, you know, why would you want to be kept in secret if you're really the man? You know, they're kind of mocking him here. Well, after the resurrection, Jesus or James becomes a believer. So it takes a lot for a brother to believe that his brother is God. I mean, imagine if your brother came to you or your sister, if you don't have a brother, came to you and said, hey, by the way, I made the whole world. In fact, I made you. You'd be like laughing at them like, ha ha, you're a crazy person. I know you. Well, uh, when Jesus rose from the dead, his brothers converted. And it's one of the apologetics for him being uh, truly risen from the dead. So I wanted to point that out. It's just an interesting historical fact that we see here right in the beginning of the book of John. Now, let me ask you this. What do you learn about the spirit in John chapter 7? Verses 37 through 39 are particularly important. Right. Those who believe in Jesus are the ones who receive the Spirit. Yes? Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit. So the rivers of living water is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So here we see a little chronology historically, by the way, and that is that the Holy Spirit does not show up until Acts chapter 2. Um, that's another 
a thing you should definitely study. So the Holy Spirit was given in Acts chapter 2, and in fact, in early part of Acts, Acts chapter 1, when Jesus has risen from the dead and he's about to ascend into heaven, he tells his disciples to not go anywhere. He says, you need to stay here in this room because the helper is going to come. And so the Holy Spirit comes, and that's the day of Pentecost uh, that is now something famous in Christian history, where the flames of fire came into the upper room, landed on all the disciples' heads. They began speaking in tongues, and then Peter gets up and from the balcony gives his famous sermon in which 3,000 people become saved, and that's Acts chapter 2 and chapter 3. So um, Jesus says those who believe are going to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what's the chronology? What has to happen first? Belief, yes. And what happens even before belief? Thirst, exactly. There's an acknowledgement that what I've got is not satisfying. That I am desperate for something. When you thirst, you're desperate for water. You become desperate for something that will satisfy, something that will quench your soul. And he says, you've got to come to me. And then whoever believes in me, then will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there is a theological um, you know, camp, if you will, that says that the Holy Spirit indwells the person first, makes them believe, or saves them, and then because they're saved, they then believe. What would you say about that? What does this scripture indicate about the chronology? Yes, it's the wrong order. It's got salvation out of order. It's got the Holy Spirit coming into the person's life out of order. You've got to believe first, then you're saved, then you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there's another theological camp that says, yeah, you're saved, but you've got to pray to receive the Holy Spirit as a second work of grace. It comes later based on you asking for it a second time. What would you say about that that based on this scripture? Does this scripture speak to that theological concept? Yes, it speaks to the error. There's nothing required but faith. It says, this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. He says, whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He doesn't say, whoever believes in me, and then once they do that, asks for it, they will get the Holy Spirit. It says, if you believe, boom, a transformation is going to take place, and you're going to have the Holy Spirit flowing in you, through you, and out of you. So here's the reason why we study scripture is because when we have pastors saying things, we can know whether what they're saying is accurate or not. Okay, Um, what did the Jews mean when they talk about Jesus testifying about himself? What did we learn about that? Look at verse 7 of chapter 7. Exactly. They thought he was blaspheming. Why would they think he's blaspheming? Well, the only reason they think he's blaspheming is because he's speaking with the authority that only God himself can speak with. And so here again, we've talked about this multiple times before, but when, you know, people say, well, Jesus never intended for anybody to worship him as God. It's utter nonsense. It's, it has, it, it's, speaking completely out of ignorance to what the scripture really says, because every time Jesus got up to speak around the Jews, they wanted to stone him because he spoke as one that is one with God the Father. He spoke as one who had the authority of God the Father, and they considered this to be blasphemy. Now, so how does this lead into the discussion about fathers like who is jesus's father yes god the father the first person of the trinity is his father but who does he say is the pharisees father yes in chapter 8 verse 39 and following 
following, excuse me, he says that the devil is their father. See, it says in verse 39, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are not. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And then we get into the famous section where he says that before Abraham was, I am. So, what do we learn about the devil in this section? Yes, he's the father of lies. All lies find their origin in Satan. He is the great deceiver. He is a master of deception. So if you reject Christ, if you reject the truth, who is your father? Exactly. So what does this say to those who say that all religions basically teach the same thing? And as long as you are genuine in your faith and you real earnestly pursue your faith, you're good to go. You're going to be in heaven. Yes, absolutely. It's false. It's 100% false. See, the truth is by definition exclusionary. You cannot have opposite or contradictory truths coexist. So, for instance, I'm either standing here talking into this microphone or I'm not standing here talking into this microphone. It cannot be both. The truth of me standing here excludes all other possibilities. This is the way it is with Christianity. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. All man or no man comes to the Father but through me. That's either true or not. He is, if he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through him, then he's either telling the truth, and that's the only way to get there, or he's a liar, and he doesn't have anything to do with going to heaven. But it could not be both. Todd says, could this be in correlation with the responsibility of the father of their children? The fathers teach their kids about God and the son. I mean, definitely there's an obligation amongst fathers to teach their children. I mean, uh, the entire book of Deuteronomy and the early parts of the book of Joshua are all about the fact that the fathers have to ensure that the faith gets handed from one generation to the next. And we are definitely going to be held accountable for that. But at the end of the day, uh, every individual stands on their own two feet. They are responsible for their own life and their own eternal destiny. God has no grandchildren. And, uh, you know, my father was not a godly man. And yet here I stand before you. And I'm not saying I'm a godly person necessarily. I'm a sinner. I'm the chief of sinners, but I am for sure saved. I am for sure a follower of Christ. I am for sure a disciple of Christ. And so um, I couldn't use my father's uh, example or his lack of instruction as an excuse, because when I stood before Christ at the end of my life, I would have had no excuse. So um, good question. OK, let's go back up into chapter. Eight. Verses one through eleven. What's happening here in chapter eight, one through eleven? The very famous story. Yeah, so a woman is brought to Jesus who has been caught in the act of adultery and thrown at Jesus' feet, and they're testing him to see what he is going to do about it. And uh, this is a, one of the most famous scenes in the movie, The Passion of the Christ, 
Uh, Mel Gibson did an absolutely brilliant job depicting this scene right here. What I want us to do is let's turn to Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10 through 16. Leviticus 20, 10 through 16. And let's read it together. And let's see what we can learn about sexual immorality. It says, If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. If a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man takes a woman and her mother also, it is depravity. He and they shall be burned with fire, that there may be no depravity among you. If a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and lies with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. What do we learn, big picture, from this section of verse 10 through 16 of Leviticus 20? Well, sexual immorality equals death, yes. But there's an even more, very, without getting super spiritual, very clear thing we're, we're missing with our answers. How many people does it take to commit adultery? Aha! What word is repeated over and over again in that section there? Karen is right. The word is both. It says in verse 11, if a man lies with his father's wife, he's under his nakedness, both shall put to death. If a man lies with his daughter, blah, 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 both, both, both. The point is, it takes two to tango. So why did the Pharisees only bring the woman? Where's the man? What does it imply about these men that, and the, their heart and the intent of their heart that they only brought the woman? Are they really concerned with keeping the law? For sure they discriminated against women. But even bigger picture than that, what's it say about their heart? They're not in they're not their concern is not that the law gets upheld. Their concern is not that the righteousness is done. Their concern is that they get to stand in judgment and that Jesus get tested. And so how did Jesus handle these people? Let's go back to John 8 and let's see what does Jesus do in this situation in verse 5 it says now the law of Moses command us to stone such women so what do you say now what did the law actually say we just read it what does it really say yes it says you got to kill both people they're they're not mentioning that and by the way we see that a lot like um there's all these examples here in these two chapters of what I call the folklore of a faith being spoken. People have kind of what the Bible says. They have kind of what scripture teaches. They don't really know. They've never really examined it for themselves. They've had someone say it to them who's had somebody before say it to them who had somebody say it before to them and we have the telephone game you know i'll give you an example when there's this discussion in chapter seven and it's about where the messiah is going to be from there's this saying that they say to each other well you know you're not we're not supposed to know where the messiah is going to be from so clearly he we know he's from galilee so he must not be the messiah the the the, the funny thing about this is they very quickly later say, we know the Messiah is going to be from Bethlehem. Well, this is funny on two or three levels. Number one, 
it never tells us that we don't know where the Messiah is going to be from. Of course, we know where the Messiah is going to be from. Um, the second thing is that's funny about this is it says he's from Galilee when actually he was from both Nazareth and Bethlehem, depending on where you wanted to place him from. But he was born in Bethlehem. And then the fact that he was born in Bethlehem and they say, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So it must not be him again. They didn't even know what they were talking about. So this is the point is this. People, they just have this kind of folklore faith. Don't be one of those people. Don't have folklore faith. Know what the word really says. So here we are again. The Pharisees say, the law of Moses says, we've got to stone this woman. That's not actually what it says. It says that we've got to stone both. So then what's Jesus do? Some of you, one of you just mentioned it. First thing he does is he bends down and he writes with his finger in the ground. Why did he do that, do you think? Letitia thinks it was to distract them. I don't believe that's why. We don't really know what he wrote. I think he was angry. I think that he was fuming over these Pharisees and their hearts because he hates sin and he hates the misrepresentation of his word. And this is just conjecture. But I think he was demonstrating patience. I think he was drawing in the sand because that's what you do as a leader so that you don't blow up in somebody's face. You take a little personal time out. I think Jesus was drawing in the sand to let his ire calm down and handle the situation with the, the tact that he demonstrates. And so then once he's drawn in the sand, what does he say to them? Yeah. Hey, if you're without sin, throw the first stone. And then he goes right back to the sand. He doesn't stare them down and try to, he doesn't raise their pride. He just says it, the truth, and goes right back to drawing. And what ends up happening? Yeah, they walked off one by one by one. None of them were without sin. None of them could stand in judgment over this woman. Now, what's he then say to the woman? Yeah, he's like, where are they? They didn't condemn you? Now, does he approve of her actions? No, absolutely not. He doesn't say, you didn't do anything wrong. He simply says... I don't condemn you either. And then we know that he doesn't approve because what's the last thing he says to her? Go and sin no more. Now, this is an interesting notion. And uh, we, we haven't talked about this much in this program, but in my other discipleship program that I lead, um, you know, that we're further down the path than this discipleship program. We're studying a lot of theological concepts. And... One of the things that you'll hear people say all the time is, well, I mean, I'm only human. I mean, I can't be perfect. But Scripture doesn't actually give us an indication that we can't be perfect once we're saved. Scripture gives us every indication, in fact, that we can be perfect. And we are told in multiple parts of Scripture, such as 1 Peter, be holy just as your Father in heaven is holy. And what we are... What, we, what it indicates to us is that when we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that raised Christ from the dead into us, we do have the capacity to sin no more. Now, does this mean we beat ourselves up if we do sin? No, because it also says in Romans 8, 1, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we're not supposed to beat ourselves up if we find ourselves sinning, but it does indicate to us that it is possible to be without sin. In fact, we're told many places, Romans, Ephesians, 1 Peter, 1 Timothy, we're told, and, and even in 1 John, many places, we're told that we have it within us to live a holy life, to operate without sin, because we are freed from slavery 
to sin. It says we're no longer slaves to sin. See, before we're saved, we're a slave to sin. We have no choice. Slave is our master. But once we're saved, slavery to sin goes bye-bye, and we are now freed to live a new life in Christ. And so that's what we're encouraged to do. So I would just encourage you, don't give yourself an out. Well, I'm only human after all. Not if you're saved, you're not. You're a human, but you've been empowered with the Holy Spirit and you've been made a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And we should do as this woman is told to do. We should go and sin no more. Okay. Next. Why, according to John 8, 24, did some of the Jews die in their sins? Yes, unbelief. Unless you believe I am he, you will die in your sins. So here again, what about the people who say all roads lead to Rome? The well-meaning Jew probably goes to heaven too. The well-meaning Muslim goes to heaven too. It's not just belief. It's belief that what? That he is the Christ. Exactly. That he is the promised Messiah that would save the world. Now, how do we know if we're truly his disciples? We get an indication in verse 31. Yes, if you abide in his word, you're truly his disciples. If you practice the truth, if you do what he says, then you are his. See, in verse 34, it says, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. So it's not a matter of being Jewish makes you saved. It's that you abide in Christ. You abide in his word. So what does this indicate is possible? What does it what does it indicate is possible if he has to tell us that the way to know whether we're going to stay in the house and the way to know whether we're really his disciples are if we abide in him. Yes, we can be one with him, of course. What if I said this to my son? There's a delivery coming to the house. If you're here when they show up, they'll drop the package off. What am I implying by that without saying it? Yeah, he's got to be at the house, doesn't he? If he's not there, they're not dropping the package off. That's what's implied. If I say, if you, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, what am I implying? Well, we're going round and round it, so I'll just state it outright. It's possible to not abide in his word and not be his disciple and not be kept in the house because you're not his son. That's what's possible. If you abide, you're my disciples. That means it's possible to not abide. And there will be people who don't. There will be people who reject Christ and they won't see the kingdom of heaven. That's what's possible. That's what we've got to make sure we comprehend. This isn't a get out of jail free card. This isn't come down the aisle, say the few words, and then you're good to go. And no matter what you do from that point forward, you're fine. There's no concern for you. Not true. It's those that abide in Christ. We're going to see later in John 15. He is the vine. We are the branches. Those who abide in him bear fruit. Those who don't bear fruit will be cut off by the vine dresser and thrown into the fire. Don says, you're not saying it's based on works, right? No, I'm not saying it's based on works, but faith and belief is not a work. There is something known as apostasy. It is the rejection of Christ. It is not abiding in him, and it is a real possibility. 
something that we need to be made aware of, something that we as Christians have to be sober minded about. So, with that said, let's look. Um, one last thing I want to talk about, and that is going back to this idea of rejecting Christ. See, when we say we believe, He says, unless you believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. They say to him, who are you? See, belief in Jesus in a a saving sense, in a salvation sense, is not believing in a a human that one time lived historically named Jesus. That's not what it it means. It means to believe in the deity of Christ, to believe that he is one with the Father, equal to him in character, and attributes. That's the person. That's what true belief in Christ means. And so anyone who rejects Christ's deity is not a believer in Jesus. The Mormons reject the deity of Christ. The Jehovah's Witnesses reject the deity of Christ. The Seventh-day Adventists reject the deity of Christ. The Muslims reject the deity of Christ. Hindus say Jesus is deity, but so is everything else. There's not one father over all. So it's also rejecting the true nature of the deity of Christ. The only way to have salvation is to believe in Jesus as he actually is. This is one of the problems with the word of faith movement, which is a heresy that preaches a health and wealth gospel. And people come to Christ, so to speak. But the question is, what Christ are they coming to? They're coming down the aisle, coming to some sort of spiritual Santa Claus, some spiritual lottery ticket that's going to make them healthy or make them wealthy in the earthly sense. Well, are they really coming to the biblical Christ? Only God knows in their circumstance, but it's why preaching that gospel is so dangerous because it is not preaching the biblical Christ. It's preaching an other Christ. And in order to be saved, we've got to believe in the Christ of the Bible. So I would just believe or I would just ask you, do you believe in Christ as deity? Do you believe that he is the only way? the only truth, and the only life? Do you believe that there's only one Father over all and that Jesus is one with him? If so, you're saved. If you are doubting that, that's where we're going to run into problems, and that's where your salvation would come into question. Okay, any last questions before we jump off? Our time has run out. Hopefully this has been edifying study this week. Next week we'll get into chapter 9, which is going to be really good stuff. It's when the Jesus heals the blind man. And we get into also the discussion of the good shepherd, which is the next uh, I am statement. Okay, with that said, guys, God bless you. Um, We'll post this recording to the Facebook page and to YouTube before next week. Uh, Memorize your scripture again, and um, can't wait to be with you next time. And yes, I just saw your question. Um, We'll post the the list of the I am statements on the Facebook group. So that's a great question. Till then, guys, God bless you. Bye-bye.